All right. All right, welcome everyone to our Conversations in Environmental Communication series here at the Program on the Environment at the University of Washington. My name is Sean McDonald, I'm your host for today. We've got a fantastic guest, another fantastic guest. This is Nikolai Lasbo, he's a marketing manager at the Nature Conservancy of Washington, and he is here to share his experience and expertise with us communicating about forest health, fire management, and indigenous-led conservation, as well as his broader experience in strategic uh, marketing um, around conservation issues. Before we get to his presentation, though, I just want to start by uh, uh, start with our um, acknowledgement, our land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land. Um, I'm joining you from the Seattle campus on the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. On a more personal note, as a settler on the unceded homeland of the Duwamish people, past, present, and future, I express my gratitude to the Duwamish tribe and support their efforts to regain, regain federal recognition. Well, we meet here in this digital space today on this platform. I'd like us all to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. So for those of you who are, uh, for those of you out here there who are joining us for the first time, um, welcome. Uh, we have some folks joining us within the Zoom and more folks joining us on YouTube. The way we like to run our events is we'll, have, we'll start uh, with a brief introduction of our speaker and a, a warm round of applause in just a moment. But uh, then after about a 30 minute presentation, we'll turn it over to an audience driven Q&A. So folks who are joining us from Zoom, you can type your questions into the chat or you can raise your digital hand maybe turn on your camera and ask your question directly of our speaker. Those of you who are joining us on YouTube can type your questions in to the comment section and I will read those to our guest. And if you are joining us on YouTube and even if you are joining us on the Zoom, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, click the little bell icon and you'll receive notifications the next time we stream live. So, Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today and give him a big round of applause. Let's have a big round of applause for Nikolai Lasmo, please. Digital, real, I think it's important to acknowledge that he's um, joining us here today to share his, his knowledge, his expertise. Um, Nikolai Lesbo is the marketing manager for the Nature Conservancy of Washington State and is the strategic communications lead for the Nature Conservancy's Emerald Edge program, which focuses on indigenous led conservation in the Pacific Northwest temperate rainforest ecosystem. His 10 plus years in media have also seen him producing the website for the Seattle Times, as well as designing and creating apps at Microsoft. He's also a UW alumnus class of 2010, with a BA in journalism and a focus on political and environmental communications. I think that that broad experience and expertise is gonna be um, so interesting today as he shares with us. And I know that my students will have lots of questions for you as well. So let's give it up for Nikolai and I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks, thanks so much for the warm welcome, Sean. And uh, great to be back with some fellow Huskies. And uh, I'm calling in today from my home in the Skagit Valley, the ancestral lands of the Skagit, Stiligwamish and Swinomish peoples. And uh, I've been working with TNC. Oh, I should start sharing my screen, I guess. So give me a second to do that. Can everyone see that now? Yeah, you're good. Great. Sorry about that. Great. So as, as Sean mentioned, I'm a strategic communications and marketing manager for the Nature Conservancy's Washington, Washington State chapter. Uh, that's me there on the left with our U.S. representative, Kim, Dr. Kim Schreier, uh, last fall out on a site visit at one of our prescribed burns that I was working on. Um, I just I like the photo just I mean, apart from the fact that I got to drive uh, the congresswoman around all day to show her things on fire was, um, it does, this is a great example that we'll get into 
uh, some other related examples about strategic communications, directly engaging with politicians, lawmakers, other audiences as well too. So this was a key moment. And Dr. Kim Shar has been an awesome champion on prescribed fire at the congressional level. So I just really like that photo. Uh, about the Nature Conservancy, we were founded in the US in 1951 through grassroots action, um, but it, we've now grown to become one of the most effective and largest environmental organizations in the world. We have more than a million members and dedicated efforts of our diverse staff and over 400 scientists. We impact conservation in 76 countries and territories and 37 through direct conservation impact uh, and 39 through partners. And I'll get into some of the partner work that really expands that reach. So about my work specifically here at the Nature Conservancy. So I work in strategic communications, which will be the focus of the presentation today, but the conservation areas that I focus on are in fire management, forest health, and indigenous led conservation. Uh, when we say fire management, it's about how do we uh, create more resilient forests and other ecosystems to fire how do we build community resilience to prepare for fire, to withstand fire, and to recover after a fire, as well as how do we put more prescribed fire, controlled burns back on the ground, which would mimic historical low intensity fires that improve and maintain forest health. Uh, more broadly though, so those are in our dry Eastern Washington forests, um, but I work across the Pacific Northwest, um, as Sean mentioned, in what we call our Emerald Edge program, which is our temperate rainforest uh, program. So on the wet side uh, of Washington state, as well as coastal British Columbia and Southeast Alaska. Um, this is a fundamentally different model of conservation that's all mostly done through indigenous led, uh, supporting our indigenous partners on their ancestral lands and areas. Um, they have authority and rights uh, to manage and uh, fundamentally supporting their community well being and their economic development, in addition to environmental sustainability all while seeking to meet our larger uh, climate goals as an as our shared organizations. Um, the temperate rainforest stores a lot of carbon and uh, keeping that in old growth trees as well as improving forest health can lock in a lot more carbon. So that's broadly the, the areas that I, I focus, um, but my work touches a lot of other areas like digital media, uh, photography, other stuff as well too. So feel free to ask me about that later too if you want. So let's dive into strategic comms. Um, these are kind of three bucket areas that I think really differentiate strategic communications from mass marketing or other marketing efforts. The easiest way when somebody asks me, what do I do for a living is I tell them I influence the influencers. And this isn't necessarily the Instagram influencers, although that, that could be a target audience, but it's more that who has the levers of power, who controls the funding for conservation or who, who are we trying to impact, affect, change their minds uh, to lead toward conservation outcomes. Uh, I personally find this work really rewarding because I feel really closely and directly connected to our conservation work because our marketing is fundamentally like integrated into reaching conservation objectives. And you'll see that through some of the examples I'll share. Uh, as part of doing strategic communications, we have very finely refined, defined audiences and, and part of that channels. So sometimes our strategic communications might only be reaching maybe four people <laughs> or something, but we've identified that those are the four right people that we need to be reaching to affect the outcome that we want. And then as part of that audience segmentation and identification and doing audience um, uh, identification and like understanding our audience qualities, is understanding the channels, the communications channels that they use. Like for instance, if we're targeting politicians, we know that politicians are more heavily engaged on Twitter, for instance, and we'll prioritize Twitter as a channel for uh, putting our, our content on and tagging the politicians, for instance, or, or maybe finding like what newsletters we know they're reading, what daily news roundups or what, um, what out news outlets do they read in, in say in their district or their, um, their markets. 
And then uh, finally, and this is this is the high point, I'll go through all of these two examples is the best way to illustrate this, but really clearly defined objectives that are closely defined uh, or closely aligned with our uh, conservation or policy or other objectives that we're seeking um, to influence through our communications. So I think the best way to kind of demonstrate all of this is through some uh, case studies, uh, three examples uh, from about the past year that I've been working on um, that I think illustrate what strategic communications are in, in conservation work. And, and I like these three examples too, because they show what equitable conservation looks like and how our uh, conservation movement is fundamentally changing. So um, just wanted to put a point on that. Um, so this first case study I'll mention is uh, fire partnerships that we've been working on through uh, what's called the Washington Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network. It's a statewide network of individuals, nonprofits, uh, government entities, and local residents um, that are working on what I was talking about earlier and building that community resilience to fire. How, how do you prepare? How do you withstand? And how do you recover from fire? A um, couple of years ago in that network, we realized we really weren't representing well the communities uh, within we, where we work. Um, they didn't represent the diversity, the, the makeup of those communities necessarily. And um, the people that we were seeking to equip necessarily weren't showing up for the, the meetings or weren't engaged as we'd hoped. So knowing in Eastern Washington, particularly in the Yakima Basin and surrounding area and Wenatchee and other areas, um, large uh, Latinx population that we identified, we wanted to, to be engaged in, in the network and they, they weren't strongly engaged before that time. Um, so over the past couple of years, we've really been doing just foundational relationship building, outreach, doing workshops through the Washington Fire Adaptive Communities Learning Network to, to try to reach community leaders within the Latinx community and to understand their challenges with fire, whether it be um, like translation, not having translated materials or other things like that. And then we got to a point about a year ago in the partnership um, where we identified that there's now an opportunity for communications to come in and be strategic for influencing state level funding uh, for these programs for um, that go directly to communities and uh, support their fire adaption uh, efforts, as well as just generally changing the culture of, of how we see who does fire. Um, and I list these out here in the challenges to the right. So historically, there's been disenfranchisement of, of these communities in terms of becoming fire adapted and being part of the fire solution. And that's primarily been be because most of our fire uh, fighting systems and, and just the fire apparatus in the US is very top down. It's very federal or state led. So we're seeking instead kind of a bottom up decision making and, and enfranchisement of, of peoples at the community and grassroots level um, and increasing access and representation. So when I was asked to be brought in to support uh, communications around this, um, this was a, a head of House Bill 1168, which was a forest health community resilience uh, and fire funding uh, bill at the state legislature uh, last year um, that did pass, but we'll get there at, at, toward the end. Um, but the first version of that bill that came out didn't have uh, much to any money uh, dedicated towards community resilience. It was much more kind of agency driven, Department of Natural Resources driven uh, funding for, for forest health and prescribed fire work. But our fundamental view was that it, we need to be also equipping uh, communities as well as part of this kind of third approach as well for supporting uh, improving our fire systems. So the objective for our communications campaign around this was to influence the funding, which was through the House Bill 1168. Our audience are state legislators who could pass and support the bill and the State Department of Natural Resources who had a strong voice in determining what was in the bill. And then after the bill passed, uh, how that funding would be allocated. 
Uh, Nature Conservancy is a 501c3, so we we do lobbying uh, in Olympia for for bills we support. Um, so direct in person lobbying obviously is a channel that uh, our communications channel uh, videos, and then we identified op eds as another uh, key piece for directly reaching legislators uh, in in the papers where they read. So I'm going to play a quick video. This was a video we created um, that we showed to, to legislators in our lobbying and that uh, our partners asked for that this be created as it um, to help elevate their voices. So I'll play this now and let me know if there's any issues. Our community has been impacted by fire in different ways. It impacts our Latinx families, but it's our immigrant families too that face some of these issues that happen here with the health issues of asthma and allergies that impact our smaller children. We're seeing with larger and longer fires, more smoke along with those direct impacts to home and businesses in a community. We have to recognize that the predicted amount of fire in a warming climate is gonna be a lot more. How do we better take actions to reduce the impacts to the forests and the ecosystems we love in communities and businesses and residents of Washington? Para que mi comunidad se sienta segura económicamente y físicamente en una área donde hay fuegos, tienen que ser parte de la solución. Creo que eso es lo lo que hace que la gente se sienta más a gusto vivir en un lugar así. También ser parte del plan significa que ellos están comprometidos a ser parte de la acción. As we work with TNC to engage the voices of community and together helps us just bring a more empowering tool and give them the access and the resources that they need. Just coming in and picking up a shovel with us makes you part of our community. It's really important to include the community in our policies and strategy because I strongly believe that people support what they create. La alianza que estamos creando aquí entre TNC, Latino Community Fund y Sashimama es de empoderar a nuestra comunidad a ser una comunidad de acción y no de reacción. Si los ponemos a ellos en el plan, si nuestra comunidad tiene voz y puede usar su voz, sus herramientas que traen a la mesa, es más posible que cuando algo así suceda o cuando nos veamos afectados, ellos se sientan más empoderados a levantar su voz y ayudar a solucionar El incendio. The change happens within yourself. It's beautiful to see community come together, do solutions within themselves, to work around the issue, and implant and give back to the community to make a change. I think that's one of the things that's going to change the world, that until we see it in ourselves and get the empowerment within ourselves, that we can come back and make a change, not for ourselves, but for all. Next one here. So you can see in that that video, it, it it emphasized a lot of those top level talking points that I that I mentioned that we're really seeking to fundamentally show a, a different approach to fire management uh, that directly involves the community and and bolsters them uh, in a way that that supports their own leadership for self determining what what those our most meaningful outcomes are. So it's. Uh, and you can kind of see the tone that we had with that is we're trying to reach legislators and really sell them on our vision uh, for this and the outcomes. Um, this is a great photo of, of one of our, our partners Alma, um, from a cafe, uh, a, a nonprofit in, in Eastern Washington as part of the Washington Fire Deputy Community's Learning Network, calling in and testifying as part of uh, in support of 1168, uh, that, that House bill. Um, so they were got empowered, they became directly involved and they affected the outcome, uh, I'd like to think for, for how um, House Bill 1168 was, was funded. And it did as it went through uh, committees and onto the House floor and then and throughout the process, more was allocated uh, for community resilience than was initially. It can be a challenge with strategic communications and knowing exactly like with other marketing, it's easier to say like, all right, I put it out on social media. I got this many views. Those are our metrics for success. 
Strategic comms is a little bit more difficult. And I couldn't say like, yes, that funding directly came from these communications efforts, but I know it was supportive. And then I saw it as well through how people were empowered as part of what we're just trying to do in our conservation work. Um, you saw the photos at the beginning too. We've had in-person meetings with Hillary Franz, our state, um, uh, uh, the head of the State Department of Natural Resources, the, the State Public Lands Commissioner. And then a non kind of, uh, you can't measure it with hard metrics, but this just fostered partnership. We worked together and co-created communications. I learned a lot in that process about um, ways that I was kind of operating with creating videos that weren't necessarily in the best ways that um, that are how things could co-create. So I think I learned a lot too on how to be a better partner and that's just really rolled into our future and made uh, a, a better partnership out of this. So the, the work continues. Uh, the next case study I'll show you is from work I'm doing up in Southeast Alaska. Uh, it's called the Seacoast Trust, which is a new funding model that we've uh, been working on to co-create with indigenous peoples and local communities in Southeast Alaska and the Tongass Rainforest. Uh, it's a new funding model that directly funds uh, local communities on what they've self-determined are their highest uh, conservation or community development or economic development, tourism initiatives, or whatever they decide. It's intentionally not meant to be a Western conservation organization uh, driven um, determining what the funding goes to. Um, so I'm working in close partnership with these indigenous communities and, and local community partners and their communications staff. And there's a lot we have to work through um, about through animosity towards conservation organizations in ways that organ conservation organizations acted colonial and still do. Um, and past harm and distrust um, between indigenous peoples in the region and government agencies or, or others. Uh, we're seeking to overcome inequitable funding models. That's what the Seacoast is seeking to do is just to really overcome, uh, overcome that so that it can be done in a way that's supporting the communities first and foremost, rather than supporting uh, conservation objectives first and foremost. And then something that's been a mind of my course as I approach this project is there are ways that marketing and communications can be colonial or can be extractive in, in how they work. Um, pulling stories from indigenous communities for, for uses that aren't um, consented to or using photos uh, in ways that weren't consented. Um, so those are things that we are wrapping into just this project as a whole and building trust. Um, so just wanted to mention those off the bat. But um, thanks to a gift from the Sea Alaska Native Corporation in Southeast Alaska, a $10 million gift uh, that spurred the creation of the Seacoast Trust. And um, it was a matching fund and the Nature Conservancy came in and matched with $7 million. So not full match, but then we're working on fundraising for that last few million as well. So in September, we kicked it off with a co-created community event um, streamed over YouTube um, that had members of Tlingit and Haida um, villages and the Sea Alaska Native Corporation, the Sustainable Southeast Partnership, and then our Nature Conservancy board chair. And our primary audience for this was to directly reach uh, the local community members um, and stakeholders who we know have kind of been foundational to the, the conservation work and would need to be bought in on the vision for this. And then we want people to be involved on it in it. So it was a really a local community target, as well as like our audiences that I have laid out here that we're seeking additional donors uh, for this effort. We're seeking to reach uh, federal agencies like the Forest Service who are allocating about $25 million to Southeast Alaska that could go to the Seacoast Trust and other policymakers at even at the globe we featured um, this story as part of cop 26 in glasgow last year as we're trying to seek that uh, and influence a global audience of policymakers and financiers and other conservation organizations to show them what a, a different model for indigenous-led conservation looks like 
Um, but I'll focus for strategic comms on this and with showing you what we did around earned media. Um, off of this event, we uh, had a separate, um, immediately after the event, a uh, breakout room in Zoom just for members of the media where everybody who was on the event went and uh, talked to the media because we were really thinking that by focusing on regional Southeast Alaska media, um, we could if anybody didn't attend the event, we could reach them that way. And that we would then have uh, headlines and, and news clips to then show to donors as a kind of third party authenticator that somebody else, that the newspaper um, feels this is worthy for, for covering. And so these were the, the top six stories. We also um, uh, focused on indigenous focus outlet, national outlets, tribal business news, and Indian country today. And then the other four are local regional outlets. So this was the, the media coverage that we got following the event. Uh, just great to see across like public media, um, public radio, uh, print news, and then online focused publications, a, a, a great reach that we had to reach our tar target audiences. And since this, we've had um, coverage in the Washington Post, and we're now working on bringing on uh, publicists to help us get more national media as we try to focus on that strategic audience of national policymakers and uh, others who can see this as a model for how to do indigenous-led conservation. So the, the outcomes, I mean, really now we're at a point where we're at about our first $20 million goal. And I've heard kind of anecdotally that a lot of the communications work that we did around that, it created a, a groundswell and momentum. And I've just heard people in the community and also people here within the Nature Conservancy talking excitedly, uh, excitedly about the program and saying they saw our news articles and that they've carried that forward and talked to a new donor. And there's another million dollars coming in from that new donor, for instance. So it's just, it's been great to see how that strategic communications around that event had had its purpose for, for spurring additional fundraising. I mentioned the national media and uh, what's next is we're kind of now in this exciting phase where we're seeking to grow this to about a hundred million dollar fund from our $20 million. So there's gonna be a huge strategic communications push here on how do we reach and tailor reach donors and tailor our communications for donors. And then going into COP27 in Egypt in the, in the fall, um, in November, um, how could we use all the great storytelling that we're doing around this to further reach global audiences and uh, even other indigenous peoples too, as well to be inspired about what's going on in Southeast Alaska. So those, that's a lot to come. <laughs> we're pretty excited about it. And last one I'll talk about, this kind of ties the two together, the last two, but um, all my focus areas too is uh, another case study on cultural burning. Um, so apart from prescribed fire is a term that we use uh, for um, how like state and federal agencies put fire on the ground. The cultural burning is really kind of a sacred and traditional knowledge um, of how fire has been used over millennia um, in North America and around the world to promote healthy ecosystems and cultural resources. Um, so the Nature Conservancy works within um, a network that we help fund, uh, found called the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network that has Indigenous members from across the country, as well as state and federal agencies, fire practitioners and others. And it's a, a network model to kind of to, to bring those people together to how do we learn from each other? How can we help Indigenous people um, work through barriers to becoming, say, fire certified and be able, being able to do fire? Because the, the tragic history is that it was outlawed. These cultural practices were outlawed and they were punished for doing something they knew was needed for the uh, the ecosystems. So trying to overcome that past harm now that was exclusion and punishment and moving away from that sole federal and state ownership, like I talked about earlier, to one that is about people in their communities and with their culture of fire, uh, putting that uh, into practice. And then uh, TNC plays a role too in that we have access to influence, like I was talking about our lobbying and at the federal level and our access with the Forest Service. So that's something that we feel we can provide through this network and help overcome that challenge for our partners in indigenous cultural burning. 
So our broad culture around fire management or a broad objective around fire management is fundamentally changing that culture of fire and having people see it as something that everybody does, <laughs> that everybody can do, that it's local ownership. It's not top-down federal and state agency ownership. And that, of course, is uh, fundamentally a part of a culture of fire for Indigenous peoples. So having that culture change within state and federal agencies, as well as the Nature Conservancy as well, too, to learn uh, from our Indigenous partners. Um, so I worked on a communications campaign uh, two years, so this is yeah, almost two years ago, it's I've been in a COVID time warp, but um, we worked, we wanted to do a communications package around um, an Indigenous Peoples Burning Network uh, training that was happening in Northern California that was bringing Indigenous Peoples together with, with other fire practitioners um, outside of Indigenous cultures and use this as an opportunity to tell a story of of the great work that's being done um, to through TNC's uh, magazine. We have a magazine that goes out to all of our members. So that was gonna be the primary vehicle to showcase what TNC's own culture change has been on fire and where we've come from um, in recent history and changing how we uh, work with indigenous people. Uh, as well as using that then as like reprints of the magazine to then directly reach federal and state agencies. Um, so I'll, I'll go through these as well uh, in the next slide. So up top left is just kind of a quick snapshot. I couldn't fit the whole magazine article on here, but I'd be happy to stick the chat in chat later. Uh, but a beautiful article um, written by a freelance writer uh, in our magazine that uh, had some great photos uh, from an Indigenous person at, at who was at the fire. And, um, but after this, so the, the success wasn't publishing this, like that was a big success was getting it in the magazine, but that's not really where it stopped. Cause like I said, that was the vehicle for us to then carry the story forward to then reach our strategic audiences. So we pitched this out to a number of forestry newsletters and websites, uh, like the Forest Service website. So you can see a, a blurb down there at the bottom um, from the USDA Forest Service website. Um, but as well, like key, new we asked around like what newsletters are foresters reading or fire practitioners reading? And we just found out who was responsible for those newsletters. And we sent them the article and was like, can you please just include this in your roundup? And that was, a strategic channel for us to ensure that we were directly reaching those people on the inside of uh, agents, federal or state agencies who were seeking to influence. And uh, we've made reprints of, of the magazine that we just carry around with us now and use it uh, in ongoing gatherings and trainings and other opportune moments like lobbying in Congress or other things as leave behinds. So it's, it's taken a life of its own. And just wanted to mention that, that that things don't stop when when you publish something necessarily. That there there's a whole usual strategic campaign around how you're actually promoting it. Uh, so wrapping things up and excited to get to some questions. Um, some key takeaways that as I was kind of putting the case studies, things that um, I kind of just gleamed from it. It was, it was fun putting this together. Um, I like the framing of opportunity and challenge to ground your strategic communications. Like the opportunity of just really helps me think on like, what is, so what is the conservation objective and where is the opportunity here for, for marketing and communications to kind of directly plug in and, and um, support that, that conservation outcome. But then also thinking through risks and challenges associated um, with, with that to help me prepare uh, for, as I'm putting together my strategic communications plans. Uh, spending time to understand audiences is fundamental from the get-go. Um, so as you lay out your priority audiences, asking around, like in that last example I just mentioned, like asking around what newsletters do you read? What, what are your news sources? Understand your audiences so you know what channels to optimize or to know how to tailor your writing, for instance, to appeal to that audience, like our fact sheets for politician uh, lawmaker audiences, they don't have much time. You've got them maybe for a couple minutes in the halls of, of Congress or, or at, in Olympia. 
you got to have like a fact sheet that just has like top five facts about this program and just really boil everything down. So that's something we know about that audience. Uh, a takeaway as I was putting together these case studies too, is that a lot of this work, and this might be unique to my work, but I thought it was a takeaway that might be relevant for others that it, a lot of this work is just really fundamentally built around relationships and partnerships and co-creating meaningful communications. Uh, at least I feel that that's what's needed for, for equitable, uh, communications and, that stuff takes a lot of a lot of time. Like as I mentioned, it took several years of that work in fire adapted communities um, with our Latinx partners to get to a point where we're kind of working together and then communications. And then even then that took about a year to kind of learn about each other and how to better communicate. So yeah, these things take time. Uh, change your approaches with feedback. Um, that video that I showed you from, from those partnerships wasn't the first. Uh, the first one I put out there didn't land very well because it was very nature conservancy centric and our partners didn't feel it was empowering enough or it didn't um, it didn't net show our partners in, in leadership positions as much as it seemed like nature conservancy was taking credit. So that was a really humbling moment for me to know that uh, fundamentally, this video wasn't meeting our objectives for building building this relationship as well as doing it authentically. So needed to almost scrap the video and start over. And then, as I mentioned in the last one, yeah, the projects don't end with publication and you need a promotions plan that really dives in and, and delivers on your stated objectives for how you're reaching your audience and through what channels and, and really laying that out. And that's it for me. I hope I didn't talk your ear off. Uh, really excited to uh, talk through your questions. And um, if you want to contact me too after this, um, that's that's my email, and I'm sure we can send it around. And I'm on Twitter as well too, so that's my handle. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nicola. I really appreciate that. That was a great overview. I really like the case studies. Um, and that gave us a lot to dive into and, and, and ask questions about. So I do want to start by just uh, once again, suggesting that we give Nikolai a big round of applause for sharing his perspective with us. I really do appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, before we dive into the questions, just as a reminder, uh, if you have questions for our guest and you are joining us on the Zoom, you can either type your questions into the chat and I will make sure that we read those questions uh, and get them answered or better yet, raise your little digital hand and ask your question directly of our speaker. I think that would be fantastic. It's always nice to hear directly from folks in our Zoom. Uh, if you're joining us uh, from the YouTube live stream, you can type your questions into the chat, and I will make sure that I read those to our speaker as well. So let's go ahead and get started, folks. Who's got questions? Aria, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, hi. I had a quick question. So I'm actually starting out. Um, I've been working with a branch of TNC, and we're kind of doing a stakeholder analysis for Eastern Washington. Um, but you talked about building relationships, and I kind of wanted to know if you had any tips on really where to get started and how to do that and how to build your network. Yeah, yes, it's, it's it's a challenge. And I remember when I started at TNC, I think like my my supervisor told me like put in your objectives like build five diverse partnerships this year. And when I got that, like I was like I don't know where to start with this. Like, do I just start cold calling people? But then they're going to be like why are you calling me? Like, what are we doing together? Like, and so that just felt like awkward, like as a, as a place to start. Um, and I found like, so with the, those, those case studies, it was being invited for a reason. Like we built relationships generally, like they knew about like through other work through TNC. And then when the partner asked for communication support, that was the moment where I was, um, brought in. And that's, that's been the case with the, the Seacoast Trust example and with the, the Latinx Eastern Washington example. And then through co-creating and kind of co-working together on like shared communications projects, 
I could then build a more authentic relationship where I was being reciprocal and lending something to the relationship. And that then fostered now in a place where I feel like I can call up those partners or we can work on new projects together in ways um, that that are respectful and just seem like they're not that icky, kind of just, yeah, trying to start something without a reason to start a relationship. So it's it's a super challenge. I think kind of apart from that, the the other best thing to do is just find that trusted intermediary that already has that relationship. Um, that's like, it was somebody from the Nature Conservancy in both of those examples who brought me in to those two projects and asked for my support for the partnership. And they were then the, the bridge and could kind of help me build the trust and understand the partnership and uh, help me navigate all of that. And so I would, I would look for the, the people who, you know, might have the, the existing relationships with any partners you're trying to build. Yeah, that's that's a really great point. Uh, I appreciate that perspective on on the issue. Um, as a reminder, folks, if you have questions, you can go ahead and raise your digital hand. It, it'd be great if you could also turn on your camera when you ask your question, so we can uh, make that face to face connection if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, the uh, I'll just maybe take a question from the chat real quick. Uh, Taylor asked a question about. Um, overcoming challenges in the case studies. One that sort of stuck out there at the end, which I thought was really interesting, is um, you mentioned, in, especially within your first case study, that some of your partners did not like the, the sort of the message or the sort of the tone of the first video that you produced. I'd love to hear more about that because one of the things that struck me about that video was that you had, uh, you had, so, you had many you know, a diverse group of people represented in the video. And of course, they were also speaking Spanish and that, that struck me as being a unique aspect of that. So can you speak more about it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that challenge, and I don't know too, like, I mean, the there are a lot of challenges that come up and maybe the, the framing on each of those slides that I did of like a challenge isn't quite right. They were more, those are more tied to like just the, the big picture things that we're trying to fix <laughs> through, through yeah. this work. Um, but yeah, that challenge you mentioned about um, how the video was received was was tough, and it um, I think it 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 kind of all came down to like what kind of soft skills somebody has to kind of deal with something like that when they're told told like their product sucks and uh, and like this this hurts our relationship uh, was the feedback I got, and it's you can either take that as an opportunity, I mean, be humble, learn from it um and be willing to to work still on it and not just become defensive um i think that's really the only way to approach something like that um and then to to work on and be authentic in a relationship <laughs> you know and uh we've been working through this as an organization too about just looking at like what what does white dominant culture look like how does that show up in our work and i feel like i could have i mean if i had um, and surely probably did act in white dominant ways when I first put out the video in a way that wasn't acceptable, but then by hopefully um, being being willing to, to work through that and not be defensive was kind of the main thing that I, I just wanted to be really open to the criticism. Uh, so that's, that's how I approached that. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, relationships are like any relationship, it's uh, can have rough patches. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I thought the, the, the final video was uh, was quite uh, compelling and I think it was, you know, empowering in, in many respects. So I can see where um, that would, was very effective. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, Zena, I see your hand up. Hi. Um, thanks for sharing your story. Um, my question was, since you have a background in journalism, I was curious on how your communication strategy changed from when you're an editor to now when you are a marketing manager. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, it's it's been an evolution, and it was kind of the easiest path when I when I first started at the Nature Conservancy. I was um, kind of doing broad mass marketing, social media, digital media for 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 very broad audiences. Um, and that to me was, it was a pretty easy transition from, from the newsroom at the Seattle Times uh, with 
with that large readership or uh, in terms of like large, like in terms of makeup uh, of the types of people reading the Seattle Times um, over to, to directly kind of applying those digital media website production skills, video production and other things that I'd learned at the Seattle Times. So that part was actually pretty easy. And it wasn't until about three years ago that I started working on strategic communications. And I don't know if I would have been able to make the leap necessarily from, from the newsroom directly into strategic communications because it, it seems a pretty specialized uh, field that I, don't, I didn't have until I had like some experience in working with some strategic communicators. Um, there might be some people out there in like other maybe non-traditional newsroom or other journalism out, outlets that have either very niche audiences and niche delivery tactics and other stuff for, for their communications that it may be, maybe it might be a, a easier transition, but I'd imagine it would be hard if I went direct. <laughs> That's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting because last week we were actually just talking about uh, environmental journalism we had uh, some had a, had a guest speaking about that experience. So it is sort of interesting to think about the, the distinctiveness of those two fields. Oh, Lucy, I see your hand up. Yeah, hi. I was just wondering, um, this might be kind of like a irrelevant question, but like how has like the pandemic kind of changed the way, like has it challenged the way you build trust in relationships with different stakeholders? And like, if it has, like how have you overcome those challenges? Totally. Yeah, I mean, so much of relationships can really matter that <laughs> they have to be in person and i felt fortunate that last summer we were able like the, the photos that i shared from the gathering uh with our latinx partners we were actually able to do it in person i don't feel like we would have been able to do that well otherwise in our meeting with the the uh, public lands commissioner um i think for strategic comms though generally moving to a more digital air like focused world, um, more Zoom meetings, of course, but just I think there's more digital literacy from the pandemic that it makes strategic communicators jobs a bit easier because I think we have more uh, at our fingertips for um, as people need to find new ways to consume information, newsletters and, and other outlets. Um, even on social media, we can be very direct through, I didn't have a case study example for this, but um, direct paid advertising for through social media, media can be a great strategic communications uh, tool for, for reaching target audiences. Um, so I think, I think just better digital, di digital literacy spurred on by the pandemic uh, makes, makes our jobs easier. Doesn't mean it makes, I, I, I much prefer in-person <laughs> activities and being out in the field and, and meeting people and, and, uh, and doing conservation work, getting your hands dirty. So it's, I don't think it makes my job happier. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that's yeah, a great question. I see, um, you know, sort of following up on that, sort of making your life easier or more difficult. One of the things that struck me is, or strikes me is it, uh, TNC, Nature Conservancy, has um, has a reputation. It's a it's a well known organization, and as a strategic communicator, do you find that that the name recognition that TNC has and sort of the uh, I guess the uh, the platform does that help you overall, or can that sometimes be a hindrance? I'm I'm just sort of thinking about that from your perspective in the work that you do. Yeah, it can be a bit of both. I mean, it can. I really try to be through partnerships and, and others as, as reciprocal as I can, as, as when invited and find ways to bring value to our partners. And one of those values that I've often heard is just having access to say like our social media following or those channels of influence, like our lobbying or other things that we have, that that's, that's sometimes the most valuable thing that we can provide. And when asked um, to elevate say indigenous voices or other voices through our channels, that, that that can often be the most meaningful thing because because we have reach and we have that one million membership um, and followers and 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 all that, but we we can have a target on our back and we we also have um, 
past history that um, ways that conservation organization that we've acted colonial and in conservation work have sidelined indigenous peoples particularly. And that history is something that we're still working through and working on, on healing um, those relationships and trying to, to, to restart or to rebuild um, from that. So I think in, in that way is that being large and successful and having a long history in conservation, it doesn't mean that we have a lot to stand on in terms of like our past practices being the best. Yeah, um, yeah thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's any other examples for how being large hurts. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to that. All right. Yeah, yeah I, I, and, and I want to take Jace's question, but I do, yeah, I do want to get back to that a little bit because I also, I can see with, with an organization as large as yours, uh, there are a lot of parts um, and there, there's a, there, you have more than one goal and obviously your goal of your particular campaigns, um, I, I can't see it running counter to, the, to the, the goal of other communications within TNC, but, but it's in some times I would imagine competing for the same airspace, uh, mm -hmm. I just disagree. So, yeah, uh, no, no it's, yeah. it's definitely true. And it, it plays out in other ways too, where uh, some of us might be more familiar with, with best practices for working with indigenous peoples and, and respecting indigenous authority and rights and others might not have that. So I get requests all the time for like, can we use this story from a partner or this photo? And I'm almost like consulted at the end. I'm like, no, we got to work from the beginning to and through through trust to, to give them full, and it's called free prior informed consent under the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples that we have to work together from the beginning and not just ask them after the fact. That's that kind of colonial marketing that I was talking about. And there's it's still done <laughs> within the organization. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, thank you for that. Yeah. Jace, I see your hand up. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was uh, so looking at your background in photography and videography and seeing that, you know, you've in most a couple pictures you had, uh, you're holding, you know, photography equipment and, and shooting video. I guess I was wondering what is your current involvement um, with either maybe creating videos, either directing, editing, or just overseeing, uh, and I guess in, in your most recent works. Yeah, yeah, I started out as a photographer at the UW Daily, and uh, that's kind of how I got my start in journalism was, was doing that. And it's kind of slowly been like a taper down of like not as hands-on as, as I used to be. Um, like when I moved over to the Seattle Times, it was more about photo selection. I wasn't necessarily the photographer, um, but choosing like what photo went out on the homepage um, and how to feature our videos and stuff like that. But then once I got back to the Nature Conservancy, the part that I like about nonprofits, even at large ones, is there's always like something to do. <laughs> like there, I mean, there's always like a lot of different, uh, I mean, unmet needs and we need video and photography to tell our story. And often it can just be like, well, I'm, I'm there. I know photography. I'm just going to take a bunch of photos, edit them, turn them around, post them on social. And same with video. When I started, I was producing a lot of video just because we didn't have a videographer. <laughs> so that was, I really enjoyed that. But then just like same kind of thing is like, I don't have as much time to do it. So I'm still like heavily involved in like storyboarding and like conceptualizing videos and coming up with the, the narrative for the video, like the one you guys saw um, working on that one. But I'm not like out there shooting or uh, editing. I'm working with a contractor to do that, but it's still, still pretty satisfying because I can still be pretty closely involved in it. Cool, okay, thank cool. you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jace, for that question. And it's a, if, it's, um, if it's something you're interested, I mean, if you're pursuing video and photography, it's, it's a huge need for nonprofits. And I don't know if you follow a lot of like, brand video and what's happening, like say at, at Patagonia or other places with branded long form video, but it's, it's a huge kind of growing field uh, within nonprofit environmental organizations and, and others um, as well for producing quality uh, long form video or, or short form social video. Okay. Yeah. I'm actually for my internship this summer, I'm looking at doing photography and videography for Lovemorth fish hatchery. Oh, uh, perfect. I, yeah. yeah. Very cool. 
So when you say you say sort of short form social, I'm assuming like very very short videos that go on social media. When you say long form, what does long form look like in this particular context? It could be a 10 minute video is kind of that what we might call like a feature length long form for news reporting is about 10 minutes. Like if you're at a news site and I I just released one with a news outlet newsy on prescribed fire that was like 10 minutes on digital cable. Like you can imagine like if you watch something um, and they do kind of like a longer form thing on TV news, that's around 10 minutes, but uh, more like longer form than that, there's, uh, it's about 30 minutes. Um, like if I were to work on something that we would submit to a film festival or something like that, like nature documentary, uh, uh, nonprofit work, it would be about 30 minutes long. Yeah, all right, cool. Um, another question coming to us from the chat, and, and this might, this is about um, things that, parts of your work that are controversial or that you've received negative feedback on. And one of the things that struck me is, you know, part of your work obviously is about this idea of, of um, burning, cultural burning, uh, as, as well as sort of um, making burning something that, as you say, that everyone can do, not just something that's top down. That seems to obviously run counter to what we've all been told for a very long time. Like, you know, I've been thinking Smokey the Bear on on out. Um, has have you have you met with any um, negative responses to to this sort of marketing work? There is. I I love prescribed fire for the fact that it seems to be kind of. I mean, environmental work can be really polarizing, and it can be kind of a left versus right, particularly around climate change. And one thing I love about prescribed fire is it kind of is an equalizer around, I mean, across political lines or, or backgrounds and because it affects everybody. I mean, it's smoky skies in Seattle in the summer versus people living in the front lines in Eastern Washington. And, and they have smoky skies all summer that that's, it's something that affects everyone. And so it, it in that regards, it, uh, isn't as controversial as you might think, although there is kind of a public perception that I am working against generally in that kind of prevailing narrative since uh, Smokey the Bear got introduced and the legacy of fire suppression over the past hundred years. Um, there is kind of a small, very vocal minority of scientists and others who are opposed to prescribed fire. Either they just want to let it burn type um, uh, uh, approach to it or say like just hands off, no active management, let, let nature do its thing. And so that's, that's really the only kind of opposition to that, that I've encountered. Um, but there's tons of other parts of our work that are controversial to um, engaging in, in carbon markets is one that we've gotten negative media coverage lately. And it's, so that's selling carbon credits uh, from our programs. And that's something that I'm working through creating a communications campaign around to actually talk about the benefits to, to carbon market programs because they do exist. But the prevailing narrative has pretty much been very negative against carbon markets and carbon carbon credit sales by envir environmental organizations. Great. And in, in terms of that work, I'm, I'm just curious, who, who is the target of that work? Are you, are you again, focusing on uh, sort of political politicians and political influence, or are you focusing more broadly on, a, on the public? For that campaign, it will primarily be like at, at COP, the UN Climate Conference for policymakers and, and other environmental NGOs um, as well to, to see the value in carbon markets. Um, there also is a forest industry target for, for that uh, in terms of um, having the forest industry see their forests as valuable for the, the carbon that they hold as well too, and seeing that the, the benefit that they can get from selling carbon credits rather than uh, chopping the trees down. Oh, so so a, forest, a forest industry market transformation is kind of the, the fundamental piece of work that we're doing as part of our temperate rainforest work, for instance, yeah. Well, great. Well, yeah, I wanna be respectful of your time and I see that we're at the end of it. Um, I guess I'll leave you with the last word. If, if, if you can think of um, some advice that you might give to students in my class or others who are, who are interested in advocacy, communication, working with nonprofits, what, what advice might you give to them? Ooh, now you're putting them on the spot. I didn't prepare for this one. 
I don't know. I think it, I mean, I'm just thinking like back to when I was a student and just like, I mean, it's a different situation, but like getting your foot in the door somewhere, like if that's, if that's your desire, like foot in the door in a nonprofit or something, but it's, it's find a, find a mentor and find somebody to, to, to get you connected for if it's an internship or something else. Um, that's how I got in at the Seattle times. Um, and my mentor, uh, Joni Balter, like really showed me the ropes of, of journalism and kind of got me grounded in that. So, so that's really, I mean, that's the first thing that comes to mind is like to, and that same thing, like continual mentorship too, that, um, I had a great uh, mentor who showed me strategic communications about three years ago and introduced me to kind of everything I talked to you about today. So it wasn't, you need, it's, it's continual learning of course too. So yeah, I guess that's, that's my advice. Well, that's fantastic. And since you shared your, your email address with all of the students, yeah. then, I suppose you might be hearing from some of them, but yeah, happy thanks. to help however I can. And I'm happy to stay on too. If there's more questions, um, don't need to run. So, all right. Well, I do want to, I do want to say thank you. And, and I'm going to stop the, the live stream. So big round of applause. Thank you so much. Nikolai, once again, for joining us, we do really appreciate it. For those of you joining us online, please um, stay tuned. We'll be back next week. Uh, subscribe to our channel, click the little bell icon, and we will notify you the next time that we are online. Thank you very much, everybody. Great. Thanks.